Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, my show is about celebrating artists and their body of worth. What makes a great artist? How do they get from point A to point B and beyond? And I'm very excited about today's show for a lot of reasons. Uh, I had the opportunity to interview George Shakiris uh, on the, the 50th anniversary of the film West Side Story. And he has a new book out called My West Side Story, A Memoir. We're going to cover all of the events surrounding West Side Story and his career both before and after that. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you do, please consider subscribing. Uh, leave a, the like comment if you like the show and leave your comments. And if you have questions, please put them in the comment section so that we can respond to those as well. Before I bring George Akiris on, uh, let's just take a look at his iconic film, West Side Story. Oh, moon, grow bright and make this endless day endless night tonight tonight and here he is George Shakiris <laughs> hey Richard good to see you it's good to see you again. I yeah. want to begin by saying Takanas. Yes. Yes. Uh, how are you? Um, we are in the midst of this crazy pandemic that we're living in. And I want to ask, how are you doing really in the midst of this crazy world we find ourselves in? Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm doing fine. Uh, I've got both my shots, so I feel better in that regard. I'm just uh, feeling and dealing with what, what we're all dealing with. We can't see each other. We're, maybe we're starting to now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the fact that everything has been shut down, as it were, is so difficult for, for everybody, um, for the audiences, people in the theater, just as friends being able to get together and so on. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a tricky time. But it's interesting, I, I guess... Um, Things will, yeah, for, 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 for example, just the way we're doing this right now, uh, I, I would imagine now this is a, a necessary way of doing things now, but I think it's going to catch on and people will continue to do things this way because it's, it's, it's quite practical. Um, but um, it's just, uh, it's like waiting for spring or waiting for summer. You just hope that it's all going to come back and, and everything will feel good again and we'll be comfortable and we don't have to worry. And, and uh, that's what we all want. That's, that's what we all want. Yeah. Well, as I said, I mean, the real reason that we're here today, I mean, two weeks from tonight uh, are the Academy Awards. And you won the Academy Award, uh, dare I say, 60 years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it seems like it was yesterday. It, I was um, looking, and I want to tell you, George, a lot of people could take a lesson from you. I watched your Academy Awards acceptance speech last night, uh -huh. and you just kept it short and simple yeah. and off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I guess there's something to be said for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, to, to be fair, I just think what has happened with in uh, over time is that uh, there's an obligation for people to thank producers, writers, to, to, to write a list to thank a, a, a list of people and I guess it, it's politically the right thing to do and of course that makes it longer um, and then people have gotten into the personal thanks their families God and all of that and it, it does make things longer but I think there is some, something to be said for short and sweet 
Well, going back to the beginning, I mean, your book, first of all, let's start with this. Uh, what was the impetus for you to sit down and tell your story in this book at well, this point in your life? Um, I, I, it's almost like a, 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 a the right kind of evolution, the way things happen, um, because uh, I certainly wouldn't have done it 50 years ago or 30 years ago or 20 years ago. So it's the now is the time that people that we do things like that. Um, and but Lindsay Harrison, uh, the writer that I worked with, Lindsay and I are, uh, are friends, and we would just chat about things in general, having tea or coffee, or lunch or something. And uh, of course, the idea of doing that came up. Lindsay has done wonderful books. She did Tippy Hedren's book, uh, and so Lindsay, Lindsay's a wonderful. My phone is ringing. Just forget it. <laughs> um, but uh, her age is calling. <laughs> but it happened uh, just it happened out of our my conversations with uh with Lindsay and, she, and then it came to well why don't you do it why don't we we do this together and because I was uh because I would be working with someone that made it I say a little more comfortable uh although uh, it, it was I really have enjoyed um kind of reviewing things and, and being grateful a lot of the time. That's the best part, being grateful mm -hmm. and, and, and and how how lucky I've been here and there uh, and uh, reminded of the wonderful people I've known, still know people I've worked with in different parts of the world. And, you know, who could ask for anything more? It's, it's, just, been, it's just been such a great uh, experience for me. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really thankful for it everything that's happened to me. Well, I'll tell you what I love about the book, among many things, is the fact that it is your story. It's not gossipy. Uh, you're not shedding dirt on other people. Um, and you really celebrate, which is what I'm all about, uh, the people that you have had the good fortune of knowing and working with throughout your career. So kudos to you for that. Thank you. Thank I'm I love hearing that. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. That's now, great. I want to go back to this little boy growing up in Norwood, Ohio, mm -hmm. and dreaming of being in the movies. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, I mean, you go into this in the book, two things in your first chapter, where you mention that, uh, and I forgive me, the person who said most biographies should start with the second chapter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. we're going to go back to the very beginning and the fact that you loved going to the movies, but your dream to be on that screen was not about fame and fortune. It was a matter of escaping into that world. Well, uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. Um, I was three years. I was born in Ohio. I, we left when I was three, so I was mm -hmm. I was I was a kid, uh, and we moved to Tucson, Arizona. Once we moved to Tucson, a couple of nice things happened. I sang in a the Tucson Boys Choir, so that became uh, a, a, a wonderful thing to do, and and that's when I started really getting going to movies, uh, and how important. I mean. Uh, uh, I, if I didn't see a movie in, in the course of a week, things wasn't right, you know. Uh, I loved going to the movies. I loved that that world, so to speak. <clears throat> and I especially loved movie uh, movie musicals because uh, I, I loved dancing. I loved singing. My, my, I have a sister who's just a few years older than me, and she was the, they were the two in the family who loved all that stuff. We used to dance around in the living room. Um, and uh, I always loved going to the movies by myself because uh then when it was over i could keep dreaming by myself you know and uh if it was musical i, I would try to remember some of the songs i'd heard in the movie and sing them on the way home that, that, so I, I i i i made that world last as long as i could make it last till the next movie uh but uh how could we not fall in love with movies I mean, it's, it's impossible not to but yeah. you got a chance, you know, with many of the people that you grew up watching on the screen, years later in your career, you're working with those people, you're going to parties at their homes, you're yeah. associating with them. I mean, that's just the American dream is right there yeah. in all of that. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I, I, your question just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> um, because... It's it is it is amazing to 
uh, dream those dreams and then find yourself in the same living room as the people you've been dreaming about and who've given you those dreams and and they're so wonderful to talk to they're just they're just nice people uh but it was uh it, it was i never thought of it in terms of of, of the dream going on sort of thing but it was uh, a, a, a beautiful feeling to be able to socially be able to mix and come to know some of the people that I'd seen in movies and dreamed about. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it was your singing that got you into the movies as opposed to your dancing, which might surprise some people. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, as I said, when I was in, uh, when we lived in Tucson, I sat with the Tucson Boys Choir. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my fa my father wanted, always wanted to come to California. So we moved to Long Beach. And the uh, Tucson Choir Master knew of a, a a well-known boys' choir that sang in a, in an Episcopal church every Sunday, uh, uh, St. Luke's Chorus, as they were called. And he told me uh, when we got to Long Beach to go to St. Luke's church and try to meet William Ripley Door mm -hmm. was the, the gentleman who's the choir master. Mm -hmm. And um, I I went to, uh, and I met him and and he I he, and I sang in that choir for almost five years. And you know, every Sunday for church uh, services, we rehearsed every Thursday night, and uh, were, uh, were in services every Sunday. And uh, but that choir, over his over time, had sung in different movies. Sometimes just singing for the movies, and sometimes actually being in in uh, sequences. And so we were hired to sing for and be in a musical sequence of a movie called Song of Love with um, Catherine Hepburn, Paul Henry, and Robert Walker. Uh, and, uh, you know, Richard, just talked earlier about seeing people socially so that you dreamed of. Well, this was at MGM. Well, Being, uh, first of all, I want to show everyone here. If you can look in the second row, yeah, third from the left, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but mm. tell us about, I mean, this little kid from Ohio yeah. uh, via Arizona, walking through the doors of MGM for oh, the first time. I'll tell you, Richard, it, it, was, it was just such, uh, almost, uh, it's almost impossible to describe it. It was, it was so wild to be, and especially, even then, I somehow knew that the MGM musicals were really the best of the musicals, but we were at MGM. Uh, we had to go to school every day, three hours a day, uh, three hours of schooling every day. I probably never took it seriously. <laughs> um, but, um, and just being around the lot and seeing the different people, there was Frank Sinatra, there was Elizabeth Taylor, Mario Lanza. Uh, uh, and uh, we we got to attend um, one of Mario Lanza's recording sessions. So we were just standing there listening to him sing. And Elizabeth Taylor was standing right there very quiet listening to him as well. So it was an, it was a, it was, I, and maybe this will explain the feeling maybe more than anything. When we, we, we sit at tables to go to school, and I, whenever the sound, sound stage door opened, anybody would come in around or whatever, I, I actually thought, I'm going to be discovered. <laughs> <laughs> because we heard we heard those stories about people being discovered and the crazy way they're discovered, and I really thought that a couple mm -hmm. of times. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's where my head was. You know, that's how dreamy it all was. Uh, and so, uh, and we got to in in the uh, the sequence that we were in. It was a concert sequence. Um, uh, 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 that's it. Catherine Paul Henry played. They played Clara and Robert Schumann. And in this uh, scene, it was at the MGM Theater, that wonderful MGM Theater that's been used for so many movies. Uh, so it was a concert, full concert orchestra, the the adult choir and the boys choir in, in the very back. And down here was the, the podium where he was conducting. And uh, in this scene, uh, it's, it's when Robert Schumann starts to have uh, problems. Uh, and, uh, and, and in, in this scene, it's the scene where he breaks down and because he breaks down, everything stops. You know, all the, everything stops. And uh, Catherine Hepburn quietly walks in from the wings, comes up to him, comforts him, and then gently leads him off the stage. That was the scene. Uh, so we got to 
see Catherine Hepper, we got to, you know, it's amazing that she has such an incredible voice uh, because even though we were way in the back, you could really hear that voice. Uh, so it, it was just, it was just an incredible time experience being around those people being in a movie studio. It was, and I think it was that experience that made me, I don't know what made me think, but I've kind of thought, I, that, I want to be in that world if I can. It was that kind, it was, it was a really strong, impressionable experience for all of us. Um, and that, but now of course nothing happened. I went, went, we left the studio, went to school, I went to high school, finished high school, and um, I went on to Long Beach uh, City College. But in high school, there was a beautiful girl, uh, Joan Scanlon, who, who was a dancer, and she had a partner, and they danced for high school assemblies. And she was, she was so unlike the other girls, because I guess because she was doing something beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the guy who was her partner jo uh, joined uh, the Coast Guard, so she asked me to be her partner for a, a, a high school assembly. And so I said, yes, you know, and I was really nervous, but we worked together, we rehearsed and she had a dance instructor who helped us through everything. And we performed for a high school assembly. I was really nervous, but it felt, it felt so wonderful to be, to be doing that. And so these little bits and pieces that happen along the way, just reinforce how you feel and, and your thoughts. And it, it doesn't reinforce how, how you can, how anything can happen, but it just reinforces your uh, your feelings about how you feel about that, and that that's what feels right to you, and that's what you really hopefully can maybe do. Well, I want to go back uh, to that first film. What was the experience like for you? Again, this little boy dreaming of being in the movies or going uh, being up there on the screen, seeing yourself on the screen for the first time. Well, uh, yeah, I. I remember uh, uh, Song of Love played at the at the movie theater in downtown Long Beach, um, and I, I of course I went to see it. And the way I could see myself in in, in that scene, I was the darkest little spot. <laughs> My hair was dark. I don't know. I was a darker little person, mm -hmm. and I, so I could I could see myself that way, but just barely. But it was enough. It was enough. You didn't need to see much more to to make you feel good about that experience. But I, I, you truly paid your dues. Not only did you stand in the wings watching all these iconic stars uh, rehearsing and filming, oh, and yeah. even when you were working on films, if you were not in those scenes, there were moments where you were standing on the sidelines walking. Um, it's in the book, but if you can take us back to how uh, your film career started to unfold uh, in your words, um, and uh, many of the uh, performances uh, that you were part of, iconic musical numbers. And mm -hmm. we're going to see a few of those in a few moments. But if you can take us there first. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. <clears throat> um, Joan Scanlon, the girl I danced with in high school, she was the one who told me about a, a, a wonderful dancing school, ballet school in on Hollywood Boulevard. So I remember the address, 7021 Hollywood Boulevard, just near Grauman's. Uh, and um, she said, Sid Cerise takes class there. Leslie Caron takes class there. Well, that's all I had to hear. <laughs> so, so I took the train from Long Beach to watch a professional class one morning, 1130 professional class. Nobody famous in class. But it didn't matter. I knew that that's that I, want, I wanted to study here, so I got a job at the as an office boy in the advertising department of the um, of the May Company, mm -hmm. and, and I worked uh, there eight o'clock till five o'clock every day, and then I was able to take two classes every night, and so that's how. I, I, that's one of the first thing I ever studied. But in in studying at the school, I got to meet other kids who were already working in the course of things like singing in the rain. They were already working on singing in the rain. So I started to hear all of this, you know, just hear them talk about working with Gene Kelly and being on the set, not whatever they said. And I just sat dreamily listening to all this stuff because it was there. It's, it's, it's what I wanted to do. Um, so uh, Eugene Loring, who ran the American School of Dance, was doing a movie for uh, Sandy Kramer called The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T. 
Mm-hmm. And and he for for there was a big sequence, a dungeon sequence where he needed sixty uh, male dancers. And at that time, would you believe it? There were not sixty dancers in the union, so he had to audition guys who were not non-union. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of us got to audition for him, and, and I was one of them. So I got to work in in that sequence, uh, and I made enough money doing it to be able to join the union and then after that go and audition for for other choreographers or uh, other movie musicals so that's how i got to be in some of those some of the great uh, that was richard it was so wonderful it was well george i I hope i hope you can see the screen very well because we're going to show some of those moments uh feel free to comment on anything that pops up on the screen Uh, i think chuck will bring this on and we will watch uh here we are. Oh my God! Song of love. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's me. Yes. There I am. Yeah. Uh, stick and row down, third one over. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God! There I am. Yeah. Uh. Stars and stars. Oh, there you are. Oh, Potato, sweet potato, cheeks getting redder than the ripe tomato. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God, the pump is boy. No, 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 no. But diamonds are a girl's best friend. Extra. Zizogen, Sadiq al Bashar. Jadehi, Ula Rabuna Salakitina. Is he kidding? Not at all. It's an old custom of the East to make the stranger feel welcome. You can tell him from me, I think he's simply a doll. She's in a dressing room. She's, she's crying and she won't come out. Don't look at me. I've been milk and honey. Take ten minutes. <laughs> So that yes. I 
But the people in our room haven't moved out yet, and they say there are no other vacancies. And we just got married. Well, it won't be long. Uh, why don't you go to the bar and have a drink on the house while you're waiting? Well, we only got two days, and here's all this time being waiting. I have to tell everybody everything. Oh, haven't any luck? You'd have to be very greedy to want any more luck than this. Or my feet are freezing, Croc. Don't you ever do nothing but complain, Steiner? I'm sorry, sir. Not, sir. Sergeant! How many times do I have to tell you that? I don't mean to complain all the time, Croc. I mean, Corporal, but... Well, I've always had trouble with my feet getting cold. You just gotta get used to it, Steiner. Corporal? Yeah? Why does this arch hate me? He don't hate you, kid. He just wants to make a man out of you. <laughs> wow! I've, I, I've never seen most of that stuff. Thank you. Well, no. the uh, thanks go to my assistant, Chuck Pennington, who uh, spent, there's more, there's more coming up. So, but, so you're doing all these films. You've worked with these iconic stars. Um, I don't want to give away too much because it's all in the book and we want people to buy the book. You talk about working with Marilyn Monroe. Um, one of your favorite actresses on screen uh, was Judy Garland, and you got the chance to work with her. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you can take us there, and then the um, Cole Porter television special, yeah. and the aftermath of that. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, Robert Olson was uh, the two coring offers that these kids always wanted to work for were Jack Cole and Robert Alton, because they were fantastic. Michael Kidd, of course, too, but I, I, ne I never worked for Michael Kidd, but I did work for Jack Cole and Robert Alton. Um, so because I had already worked for Robert Alton on White Christmas and no business like show business, and I maybe I think, uh, he hired me to be a, a male assistant on Judy Garland's first uh, 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 performance in, in, in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. he, Joan Bailey, uh, who had worked with him on all of his films, stood in and learned what Judy was supposed to do. So she would teach Judy. But uh, in that show, Judy had 11, 11 guys work with her to spell out Judy Garland on different things. Um, and so he hired me to learn what the guys had to do and then teach it uh, to them. So that's how I was around Judy Garland for that for that experience. And uh, and by the way, Liza used to come. She came in a couple of times. She was probably thirteen or something. Be beautifully dressed, little patent leather shoes and so on. And she always wanted to to learn something. So I taught Liza a few of the steps that the guys did, and she learned them faster than anybody. <laughs> and um, and it, it was uh, it was kind of amazing to be around. Uh, Judy Garland. Uh, first of all, she was petite, you know. Uh, and uh, I, 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 this is uh, this story. I really wanted to. We were re we didn't have a pianist uh, for 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 this rehearsal process. We were using Judy's album. I think it's just called Judy. And one of the tracks in it is Come Rain or Come Shine. And she was using that material for for her uh, show. And because we were using that material, we rehearsed to that record. Mm -hmm. And after, I don't know how much time, a week or two weeks or whatever it was, <clears throat> Joan, and because she was, she didn't have to sing out because it was a recording, you know. And uh, so Joan Bailey quietly said to Robert Alton one day, she said, when is she going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Robert Alton said, just wait. Just wait. Because he knew her. He worked with her at MGM, Easter Parade, the Harvey Girls, and so on. 
he knew Judy Garland really well and how quickly she learned what she had to do. Uh, and just what, an, what, what a genius, mm -hmm. we all know this should turn out to be, but what a prolific uh, performer. I mean, she, and it's probably one of the reasons she wasn't too crazy about rehearsing because she learned so fast. She didn't have to keep doing it over and over again. She was ready to, to film. <laughs> but um, I, the one thing I remember, she was a, a great, you know, we all know she's a great raconteur. Uh, and she's so, so funny. And she told a joke uh, just to the guys. She loved, she loved talking to the guys. Um, and um, it, it was a really, as they say, off-color joke, a really off-color joke. And coming from her, and because she told it so beautifully, it was so hysterical. It was really, I, I'd love to tell the joke now, but I can't. <laughs> um, you can tell me later. <laughs> uh, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be anywhere near as funny, but, it, but um, she, she, was, she was amazing too. You know, I got the ground under other times as well and uh, but uh, again I never spoke to her in the process of, of this rehearsal but but I always felt that if, if, if she looked at you she she could see you mm -hmm. you know she could really see you and it, 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 I don't mean to say that that is I don't mean to, I don't mean it to sound intimidating but my point is I I think she had a sort of an extrasensory kind of perception of of, of recognizing a person and what they were really like without whatever saying anything she could recognize a personality i think i always thought that yeah that's she deeply perception deep, deep, deeply perceptional well shortly after this you in the early days of live television you do a special uh celebrating cole porter uh got rave reviews uh yeah. you took out uh, a two-page ad with the reviews <laughs> And in true show business fashion, what happens? Well, okay. Uh, for, I I loved doing. You know, Rob, because Rob, I worked for Robert on a few times, and when he found out that I could sing, uh, I don't know how he found out, but a, a, a wonderful dancer, actress, star, uh, Sally Forrest, was one of the people, one of the stars involved in in that show, and of course, she, she's an, she's such a beautiful dancer. Um, but he needed to, uh, a partner for her, uh, for the, they shoot two numbers, Night and Day and Begin the Begin. And I got to sing Night and Day. So it's uh, for Begin the Begin, that was sung by Gordon McRae, but still was a big production number with Sally, myself, and a lot of the, and all the dancers. So I, when the reviews, when the show was over and the reviews came out, I guess because I sang and because I danced and sang, I got sort of special attention because of it. So mm -hmm. I got really great reviews, but I didn't know what to do with them. So things just bopped along as, you know, I was just looking for my next job. I, I didn't know how to make anything happen, as it were. I, d I didn't have representation. So it was, a, it, but it, it was such a great experience. It, it came and it went, and I've, I, I've always loved that particular experience. Uh, but, um, but again, be, I, I, maybe because I didn't have representation, nobody knew how to take it and maybe make something more happen from it. So I mean, there did. were close calls throughout your career, again, all in the book. But you made the decision in 1958, rather than staying in Hollywood, that you were going to go to New York to pursue a career on the Broadway yeah. stage. And of course, uh, fate had uh, other plans for you. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, because uh, work uh, for dancers in Los Angeles was very infrequent. Um, uh, I had friends who had already made the move to New York, and so I thought it just seemed launched. I should make the move to New York. Um, so I did, I bought a one way ticket, and I had friends who had already made the move, and they put me up on the couch in their living room, so I had a place to stay. But they also knew everything that was going on in New York. One of them worked, worked for Roger L. Stevens, who was a huge producer. Uh, and But what was going on specifically, they were uh, replacing. West Side Story in the theater was just coming to its one year, first year anniversary. So they were looking for replacements for anybody who might be leaving that company. And they were also uh, forming a London company. So they were looking 
for auditioning people to, for, for the London company. So my friends told me to go to the Winter Garden Theater where West Side Story was playing <clears throat> and ask for Ruth Mitchell. Ruth, Ruth Mitchell was the stage manager. Mm -hmm. She later became Hal Prince's associate producer. You probably you know that, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, and so I, 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 I went to the stage door uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the performance, and the first person I saw at the stage door was Howard Jeffrey. Howard Jeffrey was assisting Jerry Robbins on all this West Side Story stuff, but Howard Jeffrey had been a star pupil at the American School of Dance, so I knew him from that. He left and he was in a ballet company. He was a very serious, really accomplished dancer. But so he had, anyway, the first person I saw was, was Howard. And he, Howard, George, you know, we were nice, it was nice to see him. And, and he said, he introduced me to Ruth Mitchell. And she was very nice, and uh, and she suggested I read for the role of Bernardo. So she gave me a script, and I think she said of a time for me to actually see Jerry, uh, audition for Jerry. He was rehearsing Ballets USA at the time. Mm -hmm. So so during his lunch break, I went to the it was the Alvin Theater at that time. Um, I went to to audition for him, and I remember him just being really kind, very nice, and the most beautiful smile. He was really gracious, and everything to make you feel comfortable. Um, so I read uh, Bernardo, and then he asked me to look at the role of Riff. And so I took 20 minutes to go back on the wings and look at Riff and came back and read, read Riff. Um, and then he asked me to learn uh, Cool, because in the theater version, uh, 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 Cool is sung by Riff. In the, in the film, it's sung by a character called Ice, mm -hmm. incredibly played by Tucker Smith. Mm -hmm. Tucker, Tucker was just phenomenal. Wow. Um, so I, I had a week or so to uh, work with a pianist on Cool. And then I came back and auditioned for Jerry again, this time doing Cool. I don't remember how I did, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it, you know, it's, it was just wonderful that it all happening. And then on my birthday, on um, September 16, 1958, <laughs> I love this story because it was such a great birthday. <laughs> yeah, but Ruth Mitchell called me and she told me I had the role of Riff in the London company. And that same day, I had seven checks from my California unemployment, $35 each. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> what, a, what a day. You know, what a day. So you go to London, you're, I mean, it's just as big a hit there as it is uh, in New York. And then you hear about the auditions for the film. Right. Yeah, the, the first thing, uh, yeah, the, uh, I, was, I did the show in London for a year and a half. Uh, I did, did the movie, then back, went back into the show after the movie. But uh, so the, the kids were learning, getting clippings from the newspapers and, and putting them on the bulletin board by the stage door. And the first uh, names that we heard that, that were being talked about were uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Elvis Presley. And, but, you know, uh, and so I, we thought, of course, makes sense that they would, but none of us ever thought, it just never occurred to us that, that we can, and you would think about, about us. But uh, some weeks later, five of us in the, in the London company got letters from United Artists asking us to do uh, a, a scene as the, uh, as the characters we were playing in the show. And I was playing Riff, but my letter asked me to do a scene as Riff and also to do a scene as Bernardo. So on one glorious day, we were all driven out to L Street Studios outside of London to do our movie test. It was it was wild. It was just wild. It was so amazing. Um, so when it was all over and it was time to go back to the theater for the show that night, we were on a, on a real high, you know. It's like um, so we go and we, we go back into the show, of course. Um, and then the week started to go by, and we'd pass each other in the hallway. Have you heard anything? Have you heard anything? Nobody heard anything. And after about, I think it was about for about five weeks, nobody heard anything. So we thought, well, that's that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then one day, one evening, not very long after that, there was a call at the stage door uh, for me. It was, it was Jerry, Jerry Robbins. And he said, uh, we liked your test, but we'd like to test you further. Do you think you could leave of absence for a week just to come to Los Angeles and do a test? 
So the, the theater management let me go for a week, uh, flew to flew home, got to see my family, hadn't seen them for a year and a half. So that was my father met me at the airport. Um, and I, I went, then I got, went to the studio and met Bob Wise for the first time. <clears throat> and uh, I don't remember what he said, but he was gracious. And then it was Jerry who directed uh, the test, at this time testing specifically for Bernardo. And I tested with a, a wonderful girl, Barbara Luna, who came, who I thought was a really hot contender for, for the role. She was so secure. So she was really, she was really, really good. Uh, and I, I loved her confidence because I didn't have it, but she did. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so did, do the test. I did well on a Thursday and on Sunday flew back to London to go back into the show. Um, and then again, weeks start to go by and you hear nothing. Uh, and one day I got, a, a, it was Bob Wise sent me a, a really, really very nice letter. It was very nice of him to bother to do this letter. But in the letter, he basically said, we're sorry, we haven't been able to let you know anything yet, something. But we feel we, we shouldn't cast Bernardo until we cast his sister, until we cast Maria. Um, so that made sense to me. And so I continued to wait. And uh, I fell in love with the tennis uh, at, at Wimbledon outside of London. I became, I, I loved, fell in love with tennis, watching it, playing it, everything. Uh, I was watching a tennis match uh, one Friday afternoon and it, with, with some friends. And I had this, it sounds so corny to say it, but it really is true. I had, I just had this urge to get to the theater. I just, mm -hmm. so I left my friends and I went to the theater. It was too early for, for the show that night, but Anyway, so I got to the theater, and at the stage door, uh, there was a telegram waiting for me that telling me I had the role of Bernardo in the film. So that was that was. It was that now? Yeah, I I interviewed you ten years ago, and I went back and looked at that interview that we did, uh -huh. and I asked if it was a difficult shift for you to go from Riff to Bernardo in the film. Yeah, and you said that having done the show for so long, that it was so ingrained in you. Uh, that it was an easy transition uh, for you. Uh, both characters, uh, you have the opportunity to play. Um, I have a clip that I want to share with you of Russ Tamlin uh, talking about working on the film okay. and working with you. And uh, I think that Chuck is going to bring that up. Here you are. Uh, in a second. Here we are. And I had been paying, focusing uh, on, on the dancing because that was uh, extremely difficult in that I was the weakest link in the dancing chain. No question about that. Uh, so we finally got to a point in that opening d dance sequence where I come face to face with uh, uh, Bernardo, George Chiris. And um, it was a simple huh. You know, it was huh. But this is the problem. The problem is that when we did it in the big Tadeo, the camera's in close on me, you know, and I come right up to the camera and I say my line, you know, <laughs> and um, Jerome Robbins says, no, cut, 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 cut. No, 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 so, Russ, that, that cue is part of the music. And it like, and if you saw the stage show uh, of West Side Story, what you see, and it works quite well, in fact, it works it's inspiring. It's it's brilliant the way it's done, and the way that it's done is that the music builds. You know, and he meets Peter and goes, da -da -da -da, and there's a loud huh, and then there's silence. You know, and then it and then it goes down and it starts to build again very slowly, musically. So Jerry says that's the way. You know, that's the way that it was written, and that's the way that uh, it should be. So. I argued and argued, and I said, yeah, but this is movies. You've got a camera in here. And I said, it's it's going to look stupid, just stupid, you know, to come up to the camera and look at George Akiris and go, ha! Like, you know, <laughs> it's just not going to make any sense. So he says, no, look, he says, we, we wrote, we got the screenplay for this. And um, so he opened it up, and he showed me, you know, on a music cue, the huh comes, you know. And that's when I said, who wrote this? <laughs> it was Ernie Lehman, and uh, I guess it was one little thing that 
that nobody bothered to change, and that's the way Jerry wanted it. Finally, Robert Wise stepped in, and and uh, after you know 45 minutes of of arguing about this, and I just I couldn't do it loud like that. So finally, uh, Robert Weiss came in and said, look, why don't you do it both ways, and then we'll use whatever. So I did it both ways, and happy to report, thank God, that they, they used my version. In fact, it was even less than, than huh. I think if, if you saw it now, you'd see more of a, it's almost like a chuckle. I just kind of, <laughs> you know, it was really low key, and, and much more deadly. Yeah. Now, uh, you go, I mean, we, the stories are legendary uh, about Jerome Robbins and working on the film and everything, but I want to move forward uh, before we run out of time. Um, Rita Moreno, who you're still very good friends with, um, she said that uh, after uh, winning the Academy Award, starring in this film, she didn't get another film offer for seven years. Wow. Which is hard to believe. Mm -hmm. um, winning the Academy Award, uh, especially since we are leading up to the Academy Awards coming up, mm -hmm. uh, people may have these perceptions of what that moment is to, uh, to win the Academy Award and then the aftermath of that. Can you take us there for a moment? Well, let's see. <clears throat> the, for, for me, uh, let's see, before we finished uh, filming West Side Story, the, the marriage company signed me to a picture deal. So I had some place to go, so to speak. And I, I didn't know about a picture deal, but I knew it felt good. Um, I one of the, when we were uh, rehearsing just during breaks, we laughed about things. And I remember Rita once saying uh, about, about the way she was being cast in films. And she said, I'm so tired of saying why you like white girl. Mm -hmm. right? Or why you why you take gold from my people? I'm not making that up. That's what she said. I know. It makes, it makes sense. It's a and, book. Yeah, but I think you know, uh, uh, every everybody in the business, everybody in the business, I think to some degree is is typecast. Uh, if he, if somebody sees you playing this kind of a role, that then they see another role like it, and they think, oh well, maybe so and so because they've seen you do it. Uh, and I think it it just took longer for that uh, stereotypical view of her, which is wrong, of course, mm -hmm. to to diminish and to fade away and to be for able to do things uh, that, were, that were that wasn't a problem. But it, I, I just, it, people's thinking is, is so ingrained. It's hard to it takes uh, it takes time and effort to to change that. And Rita was able to do that in time. Mm -hmm. you no, know, what in in I remember the 1974. Uh, this uh, there was a, a theater producer who wanted Rita and myself to do something together. So we we did Guys and Dolls. I played Sky Masterson. I was not good casting, <laughs> but and Rita played Adelaide. She was hysterical. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what she did, but. Uh, and anyway, and and later, she, I think one of, the, one of the good moves for her was when she went to. She finally made the move. She went to England, mm -hmm. and I think she, I think she did a um, what's that, that? But anyway, so that's how she she made an effort and mm -hmm. was successful with that effort to change all of that. She that was a. A, a heavy weight on her back that had to go because it was wrong for, to begin with. Uh, and thank God it's gone and she doesn't have to suffer that anymore. But it, w once a, re a reputation is built, not her reputation, she didn't start it, just the casting people started it. And, and that, it's hard to break that cycle, but she did. Now, you, you talk about going on the stage. You also, I wanna bring up company because you had a very successful tour with that, mm. uh, with the incredible Elaine Stritch. Uh, uh, you know, if you can share mm. some of your memories uh, with doing that tour. Wow. Well, I'm, see, I got goosebumps again. The, I, I love doing the show. It's, it, it's a wonderful show, but, and I did, we did it for almost a year. But when I look back on it, the whole experience, the thing, the thing, that I loved most about doing that was working and getting to know Elaine Stritch, spending time with Elaine. That was the thing that 
that uh, I took away from all of that because she's she's so extraordinary. I mean, Elaine Stritch, good Lord. Uh, I mean, uh, she's she's the epitome of how a song should be done in, in the theater. She's, singers can learn from her. They just watch Elaine, watch Elaine because you'll, you, there's a lot to learn here. Uh, she was, and she, she, she was funny. She was vulnerable. She was kind. Uh, and it went, you know, I, I had heard about her drinking reputation. That was never the case in the year that I was with her. She drank a little wine. We always worked together every night after the show. Nothing ever like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, um, but, but she's, she, she feels for people mm -hmm. in a way that's so beautiful, so caring, so correct. And most, most of us don't manage to do what, what she does in, in that regard. And also that's why she's also incredible as an actress because she locks into, she understands people she, and she understands characters whoever she's playing um uh, but I, I and and she's 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 so wonderfully honest about herself you know i know she tells in, in her one woman show about her dressing room door being open it's always open <laughs> well when i was working with her at the almonds and my dressing room door was always closed <laughs> <laughs> Well, and before we actually end today, um, I want to show a little bit of your post West Side Story work on film, because uh, you went on to do so many roles beyond dance. Uh, we're going to uh, go through some of those just as we began with the early part of your career. Here are the latter parts, and then I've got a, a couple of closing questions I want to ask. And here we are. You know what it means to be half white, half brown? how it feels. Well, I'll tell you. My moving parts work, so I don't kick. I get by. White's good, brown's good, but you mix the two together, you know what you get? Sure. <laughs> Me. Well, last night you didn't care who's better, what did you? There's a war going on in your head, and it's up to you who wins it. You will carry our message. We asked for peace. We still ask for it. What are you standing around for? They think we're going to take them all back. How can I tell them? Now look, I told you to pick the most critical. I can't pick who's going to live or die. I'm not God. First, they probably thought there was no hope of being rescued. They just get used to the idea and we show up to give them back hope. It isn't fair. We don't owe those people anything. How are you feeling, Lieutenant? What is the location of your underground headquarters? I have nothing to say. Surely you will not deny you are a member. I have nothing to say. I'm afraid we shall have to persuade you. Think of his clothes. I've been seeking professional advice. Nothing catching, I hope. Well, I understand it's a common complaint amongst people of my age and race, mostly mental. 
I get the feeling I'm being watched wherever I go. Funny boy. Vous avez la figure sale. Oh. Détachez-moi, je vais vous nettoyer. Police, police judiciaire de Paris. Veuillez nous remettre cette valise. Bon. Voilà. Manqué. Nous voyageons de ville en ville, nos lendemains sont incertains. Une blonde vous tend la main, c'est à nouveau la vie facile. Un jour ici, un jour ailleurs, notre vie comme une romance s'élance sur un air de chance, courant de bonheur en bonheur. Take my hand, I'm a stranger in paradise, all lost in a wonder. A stranger in paradise. Do you call that evidence? It is in writing. There is a girl's life in danger. What kind of idiots are you? Idiots. <laughs> Who's your groovy friend? Lisa, this is Johnny Allen. Hey, you're too much. Jump, Adriana. Jump, Adriana. Jump. I know what I want and what I don't want, and what I don't want is someone telling me how to live my life. George? We've barely scratched the surface today. It's all in this book, everyone. My West Side Story, a memoir. George, I want to ask you, with everything that has happened in your life and career, what would you say to that little boy from Norwood, Ohio, dreaming of being up there in the movies? Uh, keep dreaming. Uh, you're on the right path. Uh, just hopefully be aware of some of the business people who are not necessarily doing things in your interests. Mm -hmm. uh, so be awake in that department if you can be. One of the things I've, I've learned in my own life is never give power of attorney to anyone because they, first of all, they don't need it. And if they're asking for it, you should be suspicious. That's, that's what I would say, but keep dreaming. Just keep dreaming. It's what you love. Yeah. Thank you. Now, before you go, I want to thank everyone for being here today. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Uh, if you did, please subscribe to Richard Skipper Celebrates on YouTube. Leave a comment. Hit the like button if you did indeed like today's show. Um, and I want to let everyone know, uh, keeping our theme this week with the movies, uh, tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock, we're going to be celebrating Ma and Pa Kettle on film. Oh, God. Uh, okay. Uh, with Lon Davis. Uh, I've had the pleasure of interviewing Lon before, and I'm looking forward to this again. Um, I've been going back and watching uh, all the Mom and Pa Kettle films, and I love them. Yeah. Uh, I also uh, end every show by telling you we want to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to Amazon.com or your favorite bookstore, and you can order two copies of this book. You actually can order either the um, Audible book uh, which is available as well, uh, or you can uh, get this book. Get two of them. Keep one for yourself and send one to the second friend that pops up on your friends list. Uh, reach out to your friends, especially now. 
Um, as our dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you don't know what someone else is going through right now. And again, we've barely uh, scratched the surface today. George, I hope you'll come back sometime. I would. R Richard, thank you. So, you you've, you've made such a beautiful show. I've gotten to see things that I for some I've never seen. And uh, could I get a copy of this show? Just Absolutely. To, to You'll get a copy of stuff? it. And I, you know, and again, I want to give a big shout out uh, to my assistant, Chuck Pennington, who painstakingly uh, put those montages together. He's yeah. the best, but no one take him away from me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's so good at what he does. And he I am is. grateful for him. Uh, yeah. George, I want to give you the final word today. Uh, anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching now. And well, I want to personally thank you uh, for giving all of us uh, such wonderful performances on film. Uh, now a great book to read as well. Uh, thank you uh, for the gifts that you've given to the world and for your body of worth. Thank you. Well, God, Richard, thank you. This this has been such an. Uh, I I I'm I'm not saying anything. I don't mean. This is you. You've given me a beautiful time here, and you have given me a beautiful time. Uh, you really have. I've I've loved it, and, and it's uh, being uh, the, the clips that your lovely guy has found and all that. Just, I've never seen any of this stuff, so I'm seeing it for the first time, and it's, so it's a real treat uh, for me a beautiful reminder because you time goes in you don't think of these things but i'm thinking of them now thanks to you i've just had the most wonderful time with you with you honestly thank you so much thank you so much george love you have a great afternoon and make it a better day tomorrow everybody thank you okay